know, and I'm here to tell you about my new product for my pillow. Towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we ran through in on quad. Here's one of my towels with a nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. I mean, this is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. What a concept. I really love the towels. They're really great. They're super absorbent. I'm interrupting this commercial to let you know we're having the biggest clearance sale ever. Get our six-piece towel sets for only $29.88 with your promo code. My towel sets are made with proprietary technology and include two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. So go to MyPillow.com or call that number on your screen. Use your promo code to get our six-piece towel sets. Really $99.98, then on sale for $49.98. Now we're closing them out for only $29.88 while supplies last. Once they're gone, they're gone, so please order now. Welcome to the show, everybody. We got an awesome action pack show for you today. Uh, we've got Rand Paul filing criminal referral against the absolute liar known as Fauci. We're getting some of that today. I've never seen anything like it, says a person who apparently observed the mysterious Chinese bio lab discovered in the remote city of California. What you got for us, Ryan? We've got Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. finds a law that DACA illegal aliens Residents increasingly turning against the sanctuary city policies that we put together along the way. DOJ tries to jail key hunter Biden witness Devin Archer on the evening of the congressional testimony. And then, of course, we had him show up in the report. Welcome to the show, everybody. We are Vigilant News. I'm Justin. This is Ryan. We're the founders of Vigilant News. Nice to make it tonight. Uh, we had an awesome interview yesterday with uh, James. Rogusty, thank you. I totally botched his name. Um, but you can check that out. I have that in the show notes. I also put the show notes in the live stream chat. You can also find the links in the description where you get all the notes, all the links, articles that we have, some of the promotion, book of the month, all of the stuff that we talk about, even the Twitter videos that we show. And of course, the Telegram channel that I strongly encourage all of you to just, uh, jump into here. I just have I go on and on at length about how it is the front lines of this information war right now. I just don't even use it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago has been one of the primary sanctuary cities that they're being shipped to. Uh, it's always been this way in Chicago. 
I lived in the city for five years and I saw plenty. And now I'm hearing from friends is that an out of control situation is somehow gotten much worse. Uh, well, things are taking a potentially dangerous turn now as the Illinois governor, J.B. Pritzker, has signed into law a plan that allows foreign nationals with work permits, some of whom are illegal aliens, to become police officers in the sanctuary state. That is insane. Yeah. So this is coming out of Breitbart. Democrat legislators with supermajority in the Illinois House and Senate passed legislation in June that opens in for law enforcement jobs to thousands of illegal aliens enrolled in the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, program, as well as thousands of other foreign nationals with work permits from the federal government. Quote, an individual against whom immigration action has been deferred by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services under the federal DACA process is allowed to apply for the position of police officer, deputy sheriff, or special policeman subject to specified requirements, a summary of the legislation states. And, you know, if you think about it, it's not that there was a bunch of illegals out there being like, we really want to be police officers. We came all the way here from Honduras Mexico to police America. No. It's because there is an agenda. There's a reason they're deputizing these people. So late last week, Pritzker signed the legislation into law, which takes effect immediately. Wow. In the sanctuary state of California, Gavin Newsom has made it possible for illegal aliens to become police officers on the local, county, and state levels. The law implemented earlier this year requires only that officers have a work permit issued by the federal government. Work permits, specifically under President Joe Biden's administration, are given out like Halloween candy. Um, they're given out to border crossers, illegal aliens released into the United States after crossing the southern border. I'm sure the deep state politicians who seem to be embedded in all of these sanctuary cities see these illegals as the perfect foot soldiers. Of course, most of us are aware that MS-13 is often used by politicians to, to carry out dirty work. It only makes sense that they would deputize them as things continue to grow more and more heated in this greater 5G war that we're in. So this deputization of illegals will make even more sense once I read a bit from this next article, uh, which the headline reads, Chicago residents increasingly turning against sanctuary policies as more illegals flood their neighborhoods. So just in case you guys aren't familiar, Chicago is divided up into 77 separate neighborhoods or community areas, they call them now. What you'll see in this article detail uh, deals with Woodlawn, specifically a neighborhood on the south side between Martin Luther King Boulevard and Lake Michigan. Uh, it's actually, interestingly enough, the site for this long-planned Obama Presidential Center, which is a $500 million investment, by the way, and it's happening in a neighborhood that could certainly use that money for more pressing matters. Uh, it's a historically black neighborhood, and the fact that they are funding the illegals and funneling them in there rather than, say, Lakeview or the Gold Coast is very telling. It's almost as if these progressive officials aren't quite as interested in equality as they let on. Anyway, so let's get into the article. Chicago residents are increasingly turning up at community meetings across the city to express, to their, to express their outrage over City Hall's so-called sanctuary policies that are welcoming scores of illegals into their neighborhood. Last week, for instance, citizens in the Woodlawn neighborhood gathered to express anger and frustration over the degradation of their neighborhood after a city-sponsored border crosser shelter opened up in the old Wadsworth Elementary School there. Quote, I would ask you all to go there. This is from uh, one of the women at the meeting. Go out there at night, in the middle of the night, and see what goes on. And actually, we have a clip that will give you a taste of what things are, are like out there, at least in the daytime hours, if you want to play this one. Yeah. And this is supposed to be an elementary school. Wow. There's like actively kids going here? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> 
I would be surprised. Oh, nice. it's, one the, uh, it's one of the poorer neighborhoods in the city, but at least they haven't been trying. Right. It's not like this. Like they were in mag hats or something. <laughs> nope. I mean, no wonder these things are hotbeds for crime, rape, and horrible stuff. Because this is, how can you possibly keep track of behavior in that situation? It's, and it's just they keep flooding in, too. So it's just getting worse and worse. Well, this next clip, like that just gives you a taste. And, of course, you're not seeing what takes place that other night like this woman's going to get into. But hearing the testimony of the folks who are actually living with this reality right outside their front door puts things into an even greater perspective and mm-hmm. kind of hints at a coming confrontation. Mm. Real quick, I just wanted to show a case uh, Sammy's comment, which is spot on. Who purchased all the brand new luggage? Yeah, yeah. that's what I want to know. Like these guys came over here with new clothes. A lot of them look like new clothes, new shoes. That's you and me. Yeah, that's right. All right, here we go. Let's play this clip. Frustration, anger, and confrontations all on display as neighbors in Woodlawn gather to talk about what they call big problems at a nearby migrant shelter. New at 10, CBS2 political investigator Dana Koslop takes us through what happened. Let them talk so they have a voice. A call for order during a heated meeting at Woodlawn's Apostolic Church of God. Who's helping me? The focus, this migrant shelter in the old Wadsworth Elementary School. I would ask you all to go out there, go out there at night, in the middle of the night, and see what goes on. What's going on, according to community members, is loitering, late night partying, littering, prostitution, and at least one fight between migrants and residents. It got a little heated. Uh, things got, objects got thrown. But many of these residents say they no longer have any tolerance for the disruptive behavior by those seeking asylum here. It's making them feel unsafe. They disrespect us. They rob us. They harass us. And their patience is wearing thin. Let me say this. They got one more time to deal with it because otherwise next time they deal with it, they're going to deal with it from the streets. We're going to take over it. Nobody's going to be able to stop us from what we're going to do to them. Much of the residents' anger was directed at city officials in attendance, including 20th Ward Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor, Chicago Deputy Police Chief Stephen Chung, and Family and Support Services Commissioner Brandy Knazi. At one point, police had to intervene, breaking up an argument during public comments. And, and that absolutely is a problem. And Alderwoman Taylor says she's now seen some of them firsthand. The people who are keeping up the trouble are the people who are kicked out of the damn shelter. All of the city mm-hmm. officials here at this meeting promise that they are working for solutions to make the area around the shelter better for the neighborhood and consequences for yeah. those asylum seekers. So when you hear about, I don't know if you guys caught that, but when you hear about the street justice, it all kind of starts to make a little more sense. Is this why they are going to start enlisting illegals, deputizing them to be part of the police force? Mm-hmm. Uh, contrary to what you might think, the deep state isn't upset about the optics of setting two different racial groups against each other. <laughs> like, you know, first of all, the, the more woke people who tend to be in a, in a little better financial straits than a lot of these folks, you know, they're just, they got blinders on. They're not even going to notice that there is some sort of, you know, conflict here that goes against their whole worldview. Um, they just won't see it. They'll put blinders on, but the deep state loves it because the whole point is unrest. And, you know, <laughs> Who knows what's coming down the pike between now and the election, but it's not outside the realm of possibility that we'll see something like we saw during the Summer of Love, the George Floyd riots, all of that. And then now you have deputized illegals. Some of them could be MS-13 gang members themselves. How do we know? We don't know anything about the vetting process. And like I said earlier in this segment, I don't think they just made this change to the law because there was a lot of immigrants just itching to become police officers in america right yeah no. you know, you, know you, I don't gotta, think so. you know everything you want you'd like to add yeah well just that this is I, I don't i don't have a heart a lot of concrete understanding of these details but i'm going to make a conjecture which is that if you look at um everybody remembers the movie hopefully uh gangs in new york about the five points in new york at around the 1860s 50s 70s And what they were, we had a pretty lawless situation back then, but it was very similar. You had massive amounts of immigrants coming in. There's no way that there's enough room in the city to deal with it. So they have to kind of just force these people into living situations where there is no way that they can police themselves. 
This is also a situation where there's no poli official police in the area because it's a fairly, it's a developing situation or developing uh, city. So we don't, it's not like what we have today where there's just endless amounts of police officers to a certain extent. So it reminds me of what happened then, which is you had basically it becomes a mafioso type of a social order. The gangs control a certain region. They enforce their own version of social order. If those gangs aren't inclusive of the people that actually live there, which is what's happening here, then the people that actually live there have to create their own social order to combat the gang violence. And whoever the government wants to subsidize is will probably be the one who wins. And it won't be the, the people that have been living there for 100 years. Come, interestingly enough, the same historically black people that were supposedly are all protected and having all these you know, benefits heaped onto them because they've suffered so much in the past. Now they're being the targets of, you know, the um, the infiltration and the invasion that's happening right yeah, now. They don't love black people. They don't think black is beautiful. They do see a strategic advantage to wearing that mantle, which is just a complete facade and isn't very convincing one to anybody who has two brain cells. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's a crazy situation. Uh, interestingly, members of the Woodlawn community aren't alone. Complaints from constituents also spurred, spurred the 42nd Ward Alderman Brendan Riley to send a letter to City Hall complaining that illegals being housed in a loop hotel, the loop is the dead center of downtown, uh, are disrupting his neighborhood with drug use and sales, prostitution, loitering, littering, and rude behavior. It's interesting because that's like where you see all of the business suits coming off the train to go to the mm -hmm. financial district. That's where the Willis, Willis Tower, formerly the Sears Tower is, like the heart of Chicago. Uh, Riley told City Hall that his voters are expressing, quote, concerns about migrants loitering, littering, illegally parking their vehicles and leaving human waste on the sidewalk near the hotel. So basically, Chicago is becoming L.A. Uh, there have been many other cr clashes between city officials and endangered or enraged citizens at local meetings. At the end of May, Chicago's recently seated Mayor Brandon Johnson settled more than 300 border crossers at Wilbur Wright College, despite objections to residents. And indeed, the residents of Chicago's Edgewater community, which is a place I used to go, I used to go read poetry when my, my early 20s, used to spend a lot of time as a historic neighborhood, was a beautiful neighborhood, doesn't look too good nowadays. But, you know, the people in the Edgewater community, a little more left-leaning, they, when Trump was in office and all of the media was saying, oh, he's purging immigrants, you know, they, they're, he's just trying to wipe them out. They, info, they, they said at the time, you know, Edgewater was going to be a sanctuary and we were going to adopt all these policies. This was in 2017. But that hand-wringing contrasts badly with last week's fury in that same neighborhood as Chicago officials began flooding the area with border crossers and installing them in shelter at Broadway Armory Park Fieldhouse. If you pull that article back up, there is an interesting tweet, unless you close it out. No, I have it here. Uh, that, this one right here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that article. Go down. There's a tweet from End Wokeness. Mm -hmm. How it started versus how it's going. So on the left, that's when Trump was in office. And, you know, you want they all wanted to appear like social justice warriors. Edgewater community vows to protect immigrants were being purged versus now. Uh, just weeks, weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. Uh, I'll let you finish and I'll go in my comments. So basically they're just singing a far different tune, much less tolerant than they were uh, now that hundreds of illegals are pouring into the neighborhood. So it's just the hypocrisy, you know. The facade is crumbling. We're finding out who the true racists are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh let me pull up Sammy's comment, or maybe, maybe it wasn't Sammy's, a different f fellow over here. Uh, where is it? Crooks1 says, the social contract requires that individual citizens turn over the responsibility of dealing with crime and criminals to the justice system. When that system refuses to fill that responsibility, the social contract is broken, and citizens will take matters into their own hands. The criminal justice system does not exist to protect citizens from criminals, but to protect criminals from us. That's exactly right. Yeah, because what tends to happen in a citizen-based justice system is you got lynchings, you got beatings, you got the wild west. Yeah, wild west situation. And Posses. hey, I'll be the first one to be like, I don't want to go back to that. But what we got now is worse. Yeah. Because now criminals and every level of corrupting influences you can imagine are being inflicted upon us. And it's been going on for like 150 years, guys. It it did not happen overnight. 
So, you know, one of the interesting things I wanted to comment on in relation to um, the meeting is this. You know, the, the people that were fighting, these city council members, the legislature, the police officers, they're not the cabal. They're just carrying out the orders of the cabal. They're just as much victims of the cabal policies as we are. So you've got the, the top of the pyramid calling the shots, setting the policy. Who are those people? They're in Geneva. They're in not here. They're not living in that town in Chicago or that neighborhood in Chicago. I can guarantee you that. But their policies have trickled down into that neighborhood where globalist decision-making policies are the thing that's running the show. And what it's designed to do is to design, they, they produce really terrible results. They don't protect people. They don't create a situation where people can use their rights. They don't create economic prosperity. So it's failure across the board. And then the people look to figure out who's to blame for this. And they point to yet their own house slaves that are also afflicted by these cabal policies. So it's a perfect system for pitting one slave against another. Because, yeah. you know, the police chiefs are raging against the immigrants, whatnot, blah, blah, blah. All the, the citizens are raging against these people. Nobody's actually looking at the real problem. So to, to one last comment I'll say on this is that just like Crooks had said here, the social contract, social contract is huge. You know, if the people, if the, the government refuses to do their part, then we have to. It is we would be fools not to do something. And there's a legal process to do this. We want to produce a, a memorandum or an affidavit that details all of the instances where the, the officials failed. OK, and then you issue statements to the, the local government saying, hey, you guys have failed. You have two weeks, two months, six months to fix the problem. If you don't fix the problem, this is what we're going to do as citizens. And what you need, the last part is you need to have a real effective system to manage that, because if the citizens just have a bunch of vigilante justice where everybody's running around shooting, killing each other, then that's the cabal excuse to go in there and smash all that down. So the solution, the vigilante justice system has to be better than what we have now. It has to be truly lawful and it has to actually provide a, a real way for people to manage crimes and right losses and things like this. And that's the solution to this, guys. I mean, we could do this. We could do this tomorrow if we sat down and started working together to, right now. Of course, it'll be difficult. Assuming but, everybody gets along. Well, that's <laughs> the challenge. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there you go. All right. All right. So you want to do... Uh, Wellness company? Yeah. Like. My house is all wacky right now. Okay, there it is. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, over the last few months, you have heard a lot about spike proteins, I would say the last couple of years at this point. The truth is that when the mask mandates and shutdowns are a little more than a distant memory, the legacy of COVID and the COVID-19 vaccines will continue to plague us in the form of spike protein. That's where the wellness company's spike support formula can help. Whether you have been vaccinated or not, spike protein is something you should be concerned about. But the good news is that the wellness company has seen some really exciting research on how to best combat spike protein. Studies have shown that nat natokinase and dandelion root extract show great potential in protecting you and your family from spike protein. Dr. Peter McCullough and the team at the wellness company have the only product on the market, Spike Support, that contains both natokinase and dandelion root extract as well as black sativa extract, green tea extract, and Irish sea moss. Go to spikedefend.com and order spike support today and use promo code BADLANDS for 10% off. That is spikedefend.com, promo code BADLANDS. All right. Awesome. Grab yourself some spike defend today, everybody. So let's move on to our next article. It's probably one of the best pieces of good news we've seen in a while, at least on the surface. We got Fauci being referred to the DOJ for a criminal prosecution of some capacity by Ron Rand Paul. So let's get into this. Paul forwarded copies of the 2020 email exchanges that showed Fauci confirming that he knew, quote, scientists in Wuhan University are known to have been working on gain of function experiments. So just as a recap, refresher for everybody, if you're a little uh, behind on the facts, the real short recap of this is that Rand Paul brought up Fauci in many congressional hearings questioned him about gain of function research. What is it? What was it defined as before? What rules did we have in place to stop it? Because we had a whole treaty, if I remember correctly, of preventing gain of function research from happening. But then as soon as that treaty came down, which happens in a lot of cases, 
we had a lot of loopholes coming in, other things happening. And before you know it, the very thing that we said we weren't going to do, we're actually doing behind the scenes under a different justification, which happens all the time, guys. Anytime you see the right and the left of the politicians just stroking each other about this bipartisan support treaty that they've managed to pull out of their ass, and you should ask yourself a question. What's really going on with it? Because a lot of times it's just about placation. So what we have with Rand Paul and Fauci is that Fauci flat out lied. They were doing gain-of-function research in Wuhan. He, through EcoHealth Alliance, NIH, and NIAID was funding it, if memory serves. And so Rand Paul has the goods on Fauci, to put it simply. So now he's actually doing something about it. Uh, we got a tweet here from Rand Paul. This directly contradicts everything he, meaning Fauci, said in committee hearing to me, denying absolutely that they funded any gain of function, and it's absolutely a lie. That's why I sent an official criminal referral to the DOJ. What is uh, Rand Paul referencing here? It's a tweet by Philip uh, Melikothan Wegman, who says uh, on the 21st of G July, Rand Paul, quote, do you still claim NIH never funded gain of function research in Wuhan directed toward Fauci? Fauci responds, I never lied before Congress. Making animal viruses more transmissible isn't gain of function, he said, adding, Senator Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. Senator, Senator. <laughs> yeah, that's a now famous clip. Uh, and then Fauci in private has this email. Okay, so let's read the highlighted portion. The suspicion was highlighted by the fact the scientists in the Wuhan University are known to have been working on gain-of-function experiments to determine the modular mechanisms associated with the bat viruses adapting to human infection and the outbreak originated in Wuhan. So this is an email from Anthony Fauci to uh, Grisby Garrett. HHS. So the long and short of it, again, as I mentioned earlier, is that Fauci definitely lied. And we got we got the receipts to prove that unequivocally. Now, does that mean that he'll just roll over and he'll just be like, oh, yeah, you're right. You got me. I guess I'm screwed now. Of course not. We're going to probably have a long, bitter fight. The email Fauci sent to then Inspector General of the Health and Human Services Department, Garrett Grisby, cites a conversation Fauci had with, quote, highly credible scientists who were concerned about the fact that upon viewing the sequences of several isolates of the N-CoV, there were mutations in the virus that would be most unusual to have evolved naturally in the bats and that were there, and that there was a suspicion that this mutation was intentionally inserted. It goes on to say, in, uh, upon considerable discussion, some of the scientists felt more strongly about this possibility, but two others felt differently. They felt that there was entirely convincible or conceivable that it was entirely conceivable that this could have been, could have evolved naturally, even though these mutations have never been seen in a bat virus before, Fauci wrote. So in other words, he's saying he's citing a hypothetical as a defense. If you just look at all the facts, like ask yourself, to, to use an analogy here, if there was a murder scene and there was the gun left at the murder scene and upon forensic analysis, it was determined that the bullets pulled from the body were came from most likely came from that gun because of the firing patterns, which has been a standard thing for, you know, how many years of uh, cr crime protocol. It would be like the defense uh, saying, hey, well, you know, there's a possibility that that gun wasn't used because it's possible that the firing pattern just might have been different than before. Even though that's never happened before, the firing pattern might've been different this time. And based on that literally very slim possibility that is itself pretty dubious, you should let me off the hook. That's basically what Fauci is arguing here. Uh, let's see. Um, there's no, no indication closing out this article that we're going to see any anything from the DOJ. Mind you, we've got a corrupted DOJ. The DOJ has been in the deep state's pocket for a very long time, arguably since it was created. And the way that the cabal go governs institutions is this. There's most of the time when a cabal institution is operating, there's a whole portion of what that institution does that is not necessarily corrupt or bad. You know, FBI has this track record. Almost every institution you can think of. But there's some portion of it that is most definitely corrupt and was corrupt from the start. And that good activity that happens is a smokescreen for the bad activity. So that's what we have here with the DOJ, I would argue. And there, I have no confidence that the DOJ is gonna really do much of anything. However, it's possible that the DOJ might throw Fauci under the bus because 
my theory is this with these kind of things. And anytime the cabal do any type of grand scam or false flag or anything that they do that involves somebody committing a crime that potentially requires somebody to go down, they have a fall guy. And I mean, this is true. Any look, Watch any movie where this kind of stuff happened. There's always a fall guy. And that's partially disclosure, I would argue. So is it possible that Fauci is the fall guy or that Bill Gates is the fall guy? You know, think about it. Like, if you were running a massive trillion dollar, multi generational long satanic ritual bulls cult, abuse cult that had been operating for thousands of years, would you put yourself on the front line? So, if something went down, you know, you could get in trouble? Hell no. So, yeah, I don't think that their names need to be out in the public. They might still get off on them being known to the, the upper echelon of the intelligence apparatus or these Bill Gates and Fauci folks. They might have brushed up against this darkness. You know, but they don't need the whole world to know who they are because just knowing that they control basically everything is probably enough of a power high, you know, for them. Plus, they're ancient psychologists. You know, they they know the benefit of complete discretion, like Mm -hmm. complete secrecy. So, yeah, it's I would say that Fauci and Bill Gates, Bill Gates, even though he hides his wealth and, and he still ends up on the top top billionaires list on Forbes every year. Uh, I still think he's on a lower rung than some of these folks who literally control entire institutions, like, right. for example, the banking system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I don't expect much, but we'll see. I, I think it's considering how bad the, the how badly they're losing right now. I don't put it past them to throw somebody under the bus. To I mean, do a little it's crazy because in some of the stuff I've been reading about the cults, especially the ones who really believe in the whole satanic, you know, thing. They, they, they seem to seek the next most gruesome, horrific thing that they can do to please Satan. You know, whether it's real or just their belief or a psychodrama that they create to keep the cult members in line. Uh, either way, they're constantly trying to come up with the most next most crazy like thing that they can do to you know God's children. And I'm thinking the COVID-19 vaccines and everything that goes with it, like luciferase and, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the cells of other children and stuff like injected into your bloodstream, all the stuff Bill Gates was doing with Epstein. You know, these are things that I could see in like on a modern that never could have been achieved before. But these like the Satanist mindset is just totally thrilled about right, like, the kind right. of stuff that they dream up. Like it, it's like we think, like, why would anybody do anything like this? This has to be in the realm of just fantasy. That's the whole point. It's things that are so bad that it just doesn't seem real. And that's part of the defense that they built into the, the to all of us. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, look at the reaction to Sound of Freedom is a perfect example. Of and that. that's nothing. Sound of Freedom is like PG compared to some of the stuff we're going to get into in the Substack series, what we've already talked about in the Deep State Sinister Core, the Substack that I put out two weeks ago. It gets way worse, guys. And... Yeah. You know, part of it being so unbelievably bad is part of the defense, the built-in defense, because no one's going to believe you right. if you brush up against this world. Exactly. And yep. I, I could see how the only way I could see that Fauci and the, the execs at Pfizer and Moderna could, could actually do these things knowingly is there has to be some sort of like spiritual thing for them. You know what right, I mean? Right. Yeah. And it's not the kind of spiritual stuff we think about. Theirs is, is something very self-serving, and, you know, there's nothing that is uh, more empowering than than degrading others. And, you know, forcing us all to inject foreign chemicals into our bodies is, like, the most ultimate thing I can think oh, of. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they revel in it, it seems like. So, so awesome. All right, well, let's get to our next story. Uh, no ads? Just go right into it? Yeah, we can just go into it. All right, yeah, I guess we do. We did kind of cut down we, on the features, which yeah. is... All right, so this next story uh, deals with Devin Archer. And some of you guys might have seen last night, the news broke that uh, I had planned to write a brief on it. Actually, I think somebody did, probably Mm -hmm. Burning Bright. But the DOJ tried to jail the key Hunter Biden witness, Devin Archer, on the eve of his congressional testimony. I mean, I... Can you think of a more blatant act of corruption? <laughs> Can you think of <laughs> any other act that could possibly make you look more guilty if you're Joe Biden? You know what I yeah, mean? Exactly. I'm, yeah, I don't know what the hell they're thinking. So the first piece here comes out of the New York Post. The Justice Department is pushing for Devin Archer to report to prison just days ahead of the former Hunter Biden business partner's hotly anticipated congressional testimony, which is taking place right now. 
Uh, that's according to new court documents. Manhattan federal prosecutors on Saturday filed a letter requesting a judge set a date for Archer, 58, to start his one-year sentence in a fraud case unrelated to the first son's various scandals. And I'm sure no harm would come to him mm -hmm. while being yeah. jailed. Uh, the request came after the Second Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed Archer's 2018 conviction last Tuesday on two felony charges for his role in a conspiracy to defraud a Native American tribe. Archer, who was set to deliver closed-door testimony to the House Oversight Committee on Monday about Biden, had been challenging the conviction. In light of the appeals court ruling, the DOJ, quote, respectfully requests that the defendant be ordered to surrender at a date and time determined by the court to a facility designated by the Bureau of Prisons to commence his term of imprisonment so that he can be tampered with physically threatened <laughs> to do the bidding of the DOJ and the deep state reads the letter to Ju judge Ronnie Abrams. Archer's attorney, Matthew Schwartz said Sunday, his client will testify on Capitol Hill as planned. Despite allegations, the DOJ letter was an intimidation tactic. Quote, we are aware of speculation that the Department of Justice's weekend request to have Mr. Archer report to prison is an attempt by the Biden administration to intimidate him in advance of his meeting with the House Oversight Committee, Schwartz said in a statement per Politico. Quote, to be clear, Mr. Archer does not agree with that speculation, Schwartz added, you know, running, you know. Interference, of course. What, how would it look like to you know double down on that? Right. I guess if they could try to paint him as unhinged and paranoid, something like that. In any case, Mr. Archer will do what he has planned to do all along, which is to show up on Monday and to honestly answer the questions that are put to him by the congressional investigators. Archer's attorney is expected to file a formal response to the request from the U.S. Attorney's Office by Wednesday. He has previously argued it was quote premature to pick a jail date as Archer Mole's potential appeal options, a position the government said that it, quote, disagrees with, according to a court filing. And now this is going to lead us to our next story, which comes by way of the Gateway Pundit, I believe. Uh, Hunter Biden associate Devin Archer arrives for congressional hearing despite intimidation from Biden's DOJ, ignores questions from reporters, which we'll see here in a second when we play this clip. Uh, so there were concerns that Devin Archer would not even show up to testify that this attempt to jail is like an unspoken threat. Mm. Uh, but it seemed like it just didn't didn't work uh, because he arrived today. Uh, GOP House members called on lawmakers to return to Washington and investigate the DOJ following their harassment of a congressional witness. So it seems like the GOP House members aren't too thrilled about what the DOJ tried to do there. Uh, obviously, the Biden Department of Justice is worried that the truth will come out to the American people today, though I don't think it will. This is all this is all closed door hearing. Uh, the regime is worried that Archer will spill the beans on the Biden crime family, the most corrupt political family in U.S. history, which I don't know how you quantify that. But I, I feel like there might be a couple other families that I can yeah, right. that. low hanging fruit, kind of like yeah. we're talking about. <laughs> Devin Archer arrived around 1020 late for his deposition with congressional investigators. Archer did not speak with reporters on his way into court. And we have a short clip we can play of his arrival. He's just he walks into the building. Mr. Archer, what do you uh, intend to tell the committee today? Do you have anything to say? Did you have meetings with the Bidens? And can you elaborate on those things? Did anyone tell you not to appear today, sir? <laughs> From Devin Archer there, but again, this meeting is going to start. Going to last. So a transcription is supposed to come out sometime this week. So until then, we can only speculate as to what is actually being discussed. But if whatever Archer was poised to tell Congress, the DOJ thought it could have been devastating enough to issue this very public threat. Usually, you'd assume this sort of thing happens deep in the background if you will. So again, we can only speculate as to what's being said and why the DOJ is so spooked and why they're trying to make such a public thing about this threat. You know, mm -hmm. like I was trying to say, I think this kind of thing normally happens in more subtle ways. The public doesn't really see. So, which kind of lends credence to maybe the, the whole, the whole, this is all kayfabe stuff, but right. also it's just, maybe the DOJ just doesn't care anymore what the optics are <laughs> and they're just, I know it's so, I, I mean, part of me thinks there's a play here that there's an optics play because these guys are master, 
uh, we might think of as improvisational propagandists, like an event will happen and they'll figure out a way to spin it to, to conform to their agenda. They're not always the best at that. So there might be something like that happening here. But is it the whole kayfabe thing? Because, I mean, it's most people unequivocally believe that there was something wrong with the way Hunter Biden and Joe Biden were engaged in business dealings overseas, even Democrats at their high numbers. So are they just setting this up for Biden to, be, to take the fall in some way? And so they're just making him seem like the most corrupt guy possible? I don't know. I mean, there's a benefit for them to do that because if they what they'll do with that um, technique of maintaining control of the population is the population, the people who believe that we live in a country that's not all that corrupt are seeing what's happening with the Bidens and they're probably getting pretty nervous and like, oh, shit, wait a minute here. There's a problem. And they want to reinvest their faith back into the country and think that, oh, well, you know, things were bad for sure, but not that bad. So what happens when you throw somebody like Biden and Hunter Biden under the bus and you really paint them to be the awful corrupt criminals that everybody, you know, could reasonably think? Well, then you give all those people, once you've busted them, good faith back in the country again and the government again because they've supposedly taken out the bad guys. Like, oh, look, we did have a bad apple. Sorry about that, guys. But don't worry. You can continue to vote in our elections. You can continue to pay your taxes because we got you covered. Maybe that's but, what's happening. But what's, but it's not just Joe Biden. It's the entire DOJ being mobilized. Mm -hmm. So they, how are they going to spin that? Well, oh, we're just going to get all the people in the DOJ. Now it'll be fine. Right. I, it could be desperation. It could it be could all be. part of It's hard to. Yeah. I mean, I still maintain the idea that the, the head of the snake was cut off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the sense that, you know. but I mean, the Saudi Arabia stuff, the right. Rothschilds, we, you know, we haven't heard much from since some of the top members of the family passed away exactly i mean like the the skill of these propagandists you know the, the the what they did in the first part of the 20th century was so masterful in comparison to what we're seeing now it makes me wonder if the head got cut off the snake and we're you know it's just flailing around madly because it doesn't have any good direction anymore maybe so. the real head of the snake is somebody we never would have expected like somewhere in a dark room with all these satanic trappings, Steve Urkel is just like, <laughs> <laughs> like oh, <laughs> it could be. I mean, according to uh, Mark Passio, this you know the head of these, or there's all sorts of walks of life in these groups. So. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So let's get into. Uh, I'll do, go ahead and do some ads, and we got a little no bugs here. So if you guys haven't had the chance to check out the latest and greatest from the No Bugs Beef outfit here, now is your chance. No Bugs Beef um, is on fire. Have you ordered it yet? Let's face the facts. America's supply chain is going to be increasingly disrupted in the coming months, which means it's not if, but when there will be a food shortage crisis. Having enough protein to feed your family for several months is essential for your survival. That's why we've partnered with NoBugsBeef.com. They provide sous vide, freeze-dried, all-American beef from ranches in Texas that have never, ever given the cows an mRNA jab. The beef stored in my is beef is stored in mylar bags with oxygen absorbers for maximum shelf life. It will stay on the shelf and stable for more than 10 years without refrigeration and with maximum nutrition and flavor. That's right. The, the whole world can go completely tits up. We could have all the power, water, everything taken out. Your no bugs beef will still be ready to go, ready to eat, which is pretty awesome. All you need to do is soak it in water for 15 minutes and then it's ready to eat. These are not your typical survivor meats. They are premium cuts of ribeye, New York strip, tenderloin, sirloin, and chuck. Get your family ready for the chaos at nobugsbeef.com and use the promo code BADLANDS for an additional 10% off your order. That's No Bugs Beef, promo code BADLANDS. All right, let's get into our next article here. So this is a one that uh oh actually yeah this this one's pretty crazy there was another one i was going to cover for this spot but um i'm going to do that in the rapids instead so uh this is i've never seen anything like this another article coming out of summit news <sighs> yeah yeah chinese bio lab discovered in california and when you hear some of the details it, the only thing i could think of is that this was not an, an official laboratory because it sounds like a more like a crack den what really? It's yeah. kind of like a. I mean, between Chinese police like headquarters and now Chinese bio lab, it's like we're the United States of China, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Let's let's take a listen. Let's get into it. Why would a bio lab 
run by a shady Chinese company be operating in Reedley, uh, California, in the central San Juan Joaquin Valley, which is right there. Uh, what was supposed to be an empty building used only for storage was home to a black market type of lab testing facility. Hmm. Your centralvalley.com reports that the discovery was made after a local code enforcement officer noticed this garden hose poking out of a back wall on the building. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Public health staff also observed blood, tissue, and other bodily fluid samples and serums and thousands of vials of unlabeled fluid and suspected biological materials. Oh, man. I think I might not be going on here with all this. Uh, additionally, they have found 900 genetically engineered mice engineered to catch and carry COVID-19 living in inhumane conditions. 773 of the mice had to be euthanized, and officials found another 178 mice already dead. Uh, quote, this is an unusual situation. I've been in government for 25 years. I've never seen anything like this, said Reedley City Manager Nicole Zeba. Even the county health officials were shocked. I've never seen anything like this in my 26-year career with the county of Fresno, said Assistant Director of the Fresno County Department of Public Health, Joe Parado. The Centers of Disease Control and Prevention tested the substances and detected at least 20 potentially infectious agents, including, this is the kicker, coronavirus, HIV, hepatitis, herpes, and according to Health and Human, according to Health and Human Services. Agents also found thousands of packed boxes, packaged boxes, many with shipping labels from China. Below is a photo included in court documents. Look at this. I mean, I've seen homeless shelters that are more tidy than this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... Uh, let me, I'll go ahead and finish out the key facts, and we'll have some really interesting theorizing and commentary on all this. Uh, NBC News reports that an investigation found the tenant was Prestige Biotech, a company registered in Nevada and unlicensed for business in California. City officials spoke with uh, Zequin Yao, who was identified as the company's president through emails included in the court documents. Yao told officials that Prestige Biotech moved assets belonging to defunct company Universal MedTech Incorporated to Ridley Warehouse from Fresno after UMI went under. Prestige Biotech was a creator of UMI and identified as a successor according to court documents. Officials were unable to get any California-based address for either company except for the previous Fresno located location from which UMI had been evicted. Quote, they... The other addresses provided for identified authorized agents were either empty offices or addresses in China that could not be verified. As Kyle Bass asks in a brief tweet thread, is this illegal lab the tip of the iceberg? How many additional bio agent labs will be found? This was a lucky find. The lab was discovered by Ridley K CA or California Code Enforcement Officers when they saw the garden hose. Okay, so that's basically the meat and potatoes of the story. Now, there's huge implications. Did you want to jump in? Uh, Bones mom is talking about how Councilman Gary Bredefeld of Fresno said the quiet stuff out loud. I called to thank him from Michigan. Uh, she links to the Fresno Gov City Council. So I guess you can go and like, uh, he travels across the country to do live streams of these people. Oh, okay, okay. So, I mean, they're reporting on this right now. It sounds like there must have been some kind of hearing talking about it. And we have, who was it, Vector saying this is all a cover story, I reckon. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that, I'll, ch I'll share with you my thoughts, some of my thoughts on this. So, first of all, um, let's see, I'm going to begin this process. Uh, Okay, well, we have very good reason to believe that the cabal intentionally manufacture all sorts of crime, diseases, food toxins for various reasons. One of the reasons is that they have a religious belief. They literally believe that it is their job to initiate as much sin as humanly possible to bring about the reformation of the world. That's the Sabbatean uh, cult that later became the Frankist cult that influenced the uh, Marxist heavily and significantly. The other thing is that um, they believe that it well, that's not only is it the religious belief that it has a practical benefit. And the practical benefit is that in order to convince the world that they want to get on the slave plantation that is the cabal 15 minute cities, they need to make reality so incredibly scary that just like any traumatized kid, we cling to our mommy and daddy's leg, something like that, to use an analogy. So 
to go along with that, we have a good evidence to suggest that they have what we might think of as black market criminal drug enterprises, human trafficking centers, abuse centers, um, uh, where they also uh, in the Toronto Protocols, they talked about how they would manufacture mass shootings and push through uh, advert sexual practices like bestiality, homosexuality, transgenderism, all like that as a part of their agenda to, to create this uh, this utopic slave plantation, for lack of a better term, that we know we call the New World Order. So given all of that, have, finding a black market lab that effectively, I'm theorizing, just is, is specifically tasked to spread disease so that the narrative that we have massive diseases floating around and we need millions of vaccines and the World Health Organization and the pandemic treaty and all these kind of things. Well, you got any good false flag, any scam needs the problem to exist. If you, the mobsters are going to extort you by saying you need the protection, you need their protection. What do they got to do? They got to rough up your store a little bit. So think about that extortion model applied to the world stage with respect to diseases. They're trying to get people to get these vaccines and all these other diseases, and they need to manufacture some basis of these diseases to keep the whole thing going, like hepatitis, like HIV, and like COVID. You know what's the interesting about all three of those diseases? There's good evidence to suggest that they don't exist in the way that we think they do. HIV appears to be a test-based disease. Unless you have the test, which is a PCR test, interestingly enough, the, the, the symptoms of HIV are indistinguishable from regular diseases. And we invented this thing called AIDS. And then when somebody's labeled with HIV or AIDS, we give them toxic AZT and other drugs, which make them sicker. What happens with COVID? Well, in, unless you have a COVID test, you don't know if you got COVID because the symptoms are indistinguishable from flu and cold symptoms and other diseases. And when you're assessed with COVID, you know what they do? They give you a COVID jab and they put you on remdesivir and that manufactures the very symptoms that make the disease create the symptoms that justify their response to these diseases. So I think that's part of what's going on here. I think we have a, a what we just saw as a little window into the black market machine that is designed to foment criminal behavior and other corruptive and corrosive influences on our society as part of the grand con that is getting us on these 15 minute cities, great reset and agenda shenanigans. So, uh, anyway. I just saw uh, unrelated kind of um, Bones mom was telling me about how she called uh, one of the, the office of one of these representatives and and thanked them. She said the receptionist seemed to appreciate me calling to say thank you and letting letting us know what he knows. I, I, I was just thinking when we have these officials like that are actually standing up and doing something. You know, we, we, we all would, would maybe if we were in that position, try to do something good, but there are people actually doing it. And maybe there's nothing we can do from our home other than help raise awareness, but even just calling and just saying, thank you. I think the social reinforcement or a display of gratitude is probably gives them some sort of spiritual power to keep fighting the good fight. You know what I mean? That's a good point. Yeah. I think that's pretty awesome bones mama that you did that. And, uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think if we could do that more often, it, it would just strengthen our resolve all around. I, you're, it's a really good point, and it kind of harkens back to the uh, Chicago neighborhood thing where the residents are being, you know, they're raging against the officials because they're not happy what the officials are doing. And it's very easy to become contemptuous and despondent in the sense that, you know, the, the officials, if I'm, if I'm going to use myself as an analogy, I live in a city where it's pretty, there's pretty low crime and all that, but there's things that are corrupt. And if I go to the people that were that voluntarily put themselves in those positions to be responsible and rage against them in a way that it was unproductive, contemptuous, and ultimately divisive with respect to the social contract trust, then I deleverage my ability to use that person and these systems in order to address the real problem. So what if we, instead of doing that, we went to city officials, policemen, anyone we think is corrupt and be like, hey, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I think you probably got into this position to try to really help people, but clearly you've, you've been screwed just like we have. Instead of me blaming you and you blaming me, let's work together and address the real problem, which are these corrupt actors that are preventing you from doing your job and me from living life the way I need to. So maybe that's a good option. I smell Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts? Do you? Yeah, maybe I'm just having a stroke, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I swear I smell Brussels sprouts being cooked somewhere nearby. Oh, really? Well, I, my sense of smell is cooked, unfortunately, from 
nose polyps and all that stuff, but I'll take your word for Those it. Those might be the Brussels sprouts in my mind. I don't there know. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on to uh, what do we do? Book of the month, I guess. This is the last time there'll be a new book of the month next week. That's so. right. That's right, everybody. So um, we are have been doing the uh, Anglo American Establishment by Carol Quigley. Uh, this book is fantastic for many reasons because, as you might have noticed, there's a lot of globalist shenanigans happening. There's wars being fomented. There's the Green Revolution, which destroyed the rural economy in most of the world and then created a massive billion population slavery pool that could be used by mega globalist entities. And then those destroyed the economies in first world nations through access to cheap labor in the third world. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. What about the IMF? What about the Federal Reserve? What about the World Health Organization? What about the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, what about every shady and seedy group you can imagine that's having influence on the world stage right now? Well, a lot of them were pioneered by the people that this guy covered in the great American or the, the uh, Anglo-American establishment. Any, uh, it's just here? like, yeah, like maybe this stuff existed thousands of years ago. And now we have inherited the modern deep state. But this is what led to that creation. This is what bridges what we have now with the older stuff. And it really took it to a whole new world. It became like a global empire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, the cool thing about this is I'm big into solution and reverse engineering. So part of the reason I study the cabal and what they do is they use methods that if you strip out the bad stuff, you've actually got a really good methodology. And one of the methods they use is they appoint somebody to be the steward of something that's really important for their agenda. We should do the same thing. If we want to actually have schools teach kids real information that can they can use to actually be productive members of the society, we should be put, uh, devoting major effort to that. But what's happened now is that we've kind of just we've allowed these cabal assets to come in and slowly take over positions in our society so that now we're just subjected to them. And that's been 150 years running. So this book details some of the early um, ways that these groups work, the secret societies, the... Um, all of that, that the the international relations that went into creating the global system that we are currently living under right now. So really good stuff to know about. Link in the description. The great or the Anglo-American establishment. Check it out. Uh, Q Puncturus uh, pointed out there's 2K watching with only 200 thumbs up. Unbelievable. Uh, so just unacceptable, <laughs> folks. <laughs> I'm losing the will to fight. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. It's, I wonder how many of those viewers are actually bots versus real individuals because it always seems to be way more than you get the likes. Unless like 1,800 of them are just haters. <laughs> <laughs> you know? If they are haters, at least give us a like. You know, come on. Yeah, come on. Come on. Uh, so there we go. So that's that. Let's get into uh, some rapids. Nope, that's not it. What? Pee Wee Herman died? No way, really? I was literally going to substitute Pee Wee Herman for Urkel in the earlier Where are you? <laughs> that's crazy. I need to confirm this real quick. Not that I don't believe Lies, it. Lies, but... slander. I don't believe it. No, I thought Pee Wee Herman was immortal. <laughs> I thought for sure he would never die. I, I remember watching Pee Wee Herman back in the no! early 80s. 26 minutes ago on NBC News. No kidding, huh? Well, he, he wasn't the most morally upstanding character. I mean, from what it did seem like he might have had a little bit of sleaziness, you know, behind the uh, Pee Wee. Yeah, Herman wasn't he caught stuff? masturbating in like a theater or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. But name me a Hollywood actor who probably hasn't done that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. But anyway. But uh, damn, he! I can't believe it. Like, he's going, Pee Wee's now going on the biggest adventure. <laughs> yeah, the greatest adventure. The greatest adventure to the afterlife. Uh, thank you, Sammy, for um, whoa, what happened? There we go. Thank you, Sammy, for the rant. Really appreciate it. And please hit like and thumb up. All right. So let's move on to some rapids. Do you want to start the ball here? Oh, we're on the rapids now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, I'll do a couple. Of let's, let's see. It's 357. So just to get through two features each took an hour. So that yep. was perfect. Is it, Do we want to take this time to cut off YouTube? Oh, yes. Yes, we should do that. Okay. Right. So, yeah, we're going on live on YouTube, everybody. I might have already screwed the pooch on that one. I just forgot totally about that. Yeah, I was, we were talking about devil stuff, <laughs> like uh, kitty diddling and all that. So, I know YouTube loves that stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, they love it. They should love it. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and clip out the YouTube. I'm gonna, we're 
we have in uh, the, I can't talk right now. We have the Stillness in the Storm YouTube channel that I've had running for 10 years now. And it's kind of slowly died because we can barely talk about anything on YouTube. But I've recently discovered I can put stuff on there. So we're going to start to put stuff on there now. And before I forget, I have to shut off the studio. But while I'm doing that, you want to, if you want to jump in on a, um Yeah, we don't really need to show the articles for these first couple ones. Because the, the headline says it all here with this one. Boy Scout leaders invite LGBTQ advocates to jamboree. You know, it's like, don't Boy Scout, you think Boy Scout leaders would be trying to take the spotlight off of them because of all of the things that they've been implicated in in the past. It's almost a trope now to call Boy Scout leaders pedophiles because it's just such a common occurrence. It's like the two main jobs for a pedophile are either Catholic priest